What else can we look at to troubleshoot this? So we have retransmission. Why? That's the question. Everybody knows it's retransmission, but why? That's your job to find out. So there are some clues that you can use to figure out this problem. Okay? The first one we're going to do is look at the redheaded stepchild, the Wireshark, and that's the IP header. Everybody looks at the TCP, everybody's doing sequence analysis, uh, and, and a lot of people forget that IP layer actually is there for a purpose, right? So let's take a look. And uh, so I'm going to clear this out. Look at packet 113. It's just an acknowledgement, right? So what does this acknowledgement tell us? That we're all caught up, right? Acknowledgement means I'm up good up to this point in time. Okay, so the, the source 10 is saying, look, my, I'm good to 13.12. I got that. My next sequence number that I'm going to start with is 24.01. And we go to the next packet, and sure enough, he starts with 24.01. That's where I left off, and I'm going to send you 80 bytes worth, and that's going to come out to the next sequence number, 24.89. So if you actually add up this packet 114 through 120, okay, and you add up the length, you actually come with 982. So everything's working as designed so far. Our only problem is packets are not getting through. So what happened? So let's take a look. I'm going to open up the IP header. And, and this, this whole session, I keep going back to the IP ID field because it can help you in your analysis. Okay? It's not a guaranteed way of doing analysis because IP ID turns out not required. They can all be zeros. Okay? Um, some, some systems increment by two. Some, inc some systems increment by one. So there's, you kind of have to get a feel for what you're dealing with here. So one of the new features that uh, Core Developer added, which I'm forever grateful for, is applying this as a column. Okay? So I pick the IP ID field and apply it as a column, and instantly I get IP IDs all lining up here. Okay, for this packet. So, what do we see here? Describe to me what you're seeing. Things that should jump out at you. They're, I, I think I heard the answer here. Sequential. They're sequential, right? So if you look at this, it's F1, F2, F3, F4, and if you actually sc scroll over more, they're in decimal. Okay, what does that tell us? Nobody else is using the NIC. Nobody else is using the NIC. Why is that? Yeah, for, for IP, exactly. Why is that? Because IP is not unique to that TCP conversation. When you have multiple TCP conversations, they're all using the same IP stack. Okay, so difference FTP, Telnet, SSH, they're all going to take this IP ID and use it up. But if it's sequential like this, you know there's nothing else going on on this box. Okay, what else does it tell us? During retransmissions, there are other things occurring. Your IP ID increases uh, quite a bit. Okay, but they're all going up by one, which means that between this packet and this packet, the 10 dot guy was doing nothing else from an IP standpoint. Okay? So is the packet loss before we got to this packet trace where we capture this, or is it past it? So I'm capturing at a certain point in the transmission. Am I seeing the packet loss before or after? It's after. So now I kind of divided my problem so I don't have to worry about all the infrastructure from where I've captured it to the left side. Because this IP ID here tells me I got everything in a row, nothing's wrong. Okay? So now we see this exponential back off that we saw when we looked at the delta, right? Two, five, ten, twenty, forty, forty-nine. IP IDs. What's happening here? Because in between this ex by backing off, something is going on, right? So, again, this is all about identifying patterns. So I got this packet, and I'm scrolling down, right? 
and something jumps out at me. I'm sorry? The flag is changing? Okay. Okay. What else? Again, when you get used to the tool, this will jump out at you like a spotlight. But if you're not used to the tool and you're not used to seeing it, it's very hard for your brain to process. So when I first got this, we opened it up and within a matter of seconds we said, oh, here's the problem, potential problem. We, we weren't sure. Bursting, possibly, but look at the back off, right? Clearly, there's nothing, huge gaps of time here. What else jumps out? In the middle of the screen, what does it say? It's okay, it's fine. Just right in the middle of the screen, what does it say? DSCP, what does it say about the DSCP value? I'll give you the answer. Unknown DSCP. So what does that mean? So th for those of you that are not familiar, and actually Dr. McCann alluded to this, diff serve code points are common and they have um, specified values, right? And these are the DSCP values that packets can be tagged with. And it, you can spend the whole class on it, but it started out as kind of a uh, toss bid and, and there are a limited number of bits in an IP and TCP, right? So people keep retrofitting different meanings to them. Um, and and it, going from IP precedence to DSCP, there are certain values within, a, within an IP header that tells you what the DSCP is. And these are the well-known ones. So for example, most of you might have heard of EF, expedited forwarding that voice uses, right? There's a bunch of AF classes, CS classes, et cetera. So the, here they are, right? Expedited forwarding, CS5, et cetera. But our DSCP value is not one of them. So is that a clue? Possibly. So what was my, what did I say when, when, when I got this packet trace? I said, well, I'm not sure, but I think this is the problem. And they said, what? I said, we're going through a carrier cloud and we're giving them a packet with an unknown DSCP value, right? We're not playing by the rules of the game. So my assumption was the carrier, when they saw this DSCP value 04, nonsensical, they're throwing it away. So how do I prove that? How do I prove it within this trace? Look at the packets that succeeded. Look at the packets that were going through before, right? Because clearly we didn't start out with just this where nothing was getting through. So let's go back in time and take a look. I'm going to scrolling up. Did you see a change? That's the default. Default is zero, right? And look what happens. If you go through this analysis, the minute the DSCP value goes to zero four, nothing goes past after that. So you add this length, 142, 266, 122, et cetera, you end up with 982. So everything that was tagged as zero four didn't get through. Pretty simple problem once you know what to look for, right? So this isn't a difficult problem to solve, but this is a difficult problem to figure out when all you have is Wireshark as your tool, right? And it's about pattern recognition. So as you go down here, and, and this is, I do this quite often, I get to a problem, problem point, right? So a TCP analysis said that right here was when the retransmission started occurring. I found the beginning of the problem packet train, if you will, right? And I just kind of scroll down and see what changes. And more often than not, you'd be surprised how often when something changes or flashes in the screen, your eye automatically gravitates toward it. And if you know what you're looking for, you're going to spot the problem. So how did we prove it? Well, we did this. So I told uh, my colleagues in Asia Pacific, Cisco routers, you can ping, right? but you can do an extended ping and you can do all kinds of different things with it. And one of the things that you can do is you can go to extended, um, just type by typing ping IP, target, usual stuff. And then when you get to the extended command, you say yes. You can give it the source and then you can give it the type of service. It doesn't say diff serve or DSCP, it just says 
type of service. But if you go back to my chart here, right, we have type of service that maps to uh, DSCP. It's all the same value, right? Originally, there's type of service, then became DSCP. So you can specify different value, and sure enough, when we specified a nonsensical number, nothing went through. When we specified it with default, everything went through. Okay? So proof positive that the carrier, because this is my, uh, this router here is my entry just before the cloud, and this router is my, uh, actually the target here, is just the other side. Okay? Nothing's between me except for my router, carrier's router, the cloud, and then my router on the other side. So proof positive that the carrier was dropping it. Okay? Not their fault, really, if you think about it. But fundamentally, I had a problem. And that is, one of the things that I learned was, especially when you're doing hardware designs and whatnot, is you have to be strict in what you send out. Right? It's under my control. I'm going to follow the rules, and I'm going to be very strict and not send out garbage that doesn't follow the rules. But when I'm receiving, I'm going to be very liberal. Why? My assumption is everybody else is stupid. Right? They may not follow the rules. So um, in other clouds, in other carriers, this didn't happen. Do I blame the carrier? Not really. It's, it's a nonsensical value. But then at the same time, what do they care what my toss bits are set to? Right? Well, actually, it turns out they do care. Because now with MPLS, they charge you based on different class. So voice class is more expensive than default class. And they need to measure you. So if they, you know, from their standpoint, hey, this doesn't follow our contract. I said I'm going to give you these four cues. It's outside of that. I'm going to throw it away. OK, so any questions about that so far? Yes? What was causing the change along the way? So what caused it to change along the way? Um, good question. I didn't get into it in detail. But if you noticed at the beginning, this is a what kind of packet? SSH, right? And SSH has two different roles. One, file transfer, right? You can SCP, SFTP, etc., or it's interactive, like Telnet. So, uh, if you Google for this, there's actually a setting that says um, somebody figured out that you know what? I'm going to differentiate between a bulk transfer and an interactive, and I'm going to use 04 as my diff serve. The fact that it doesn't exist was kind of unfortunate. Right? But the idea here was that SSH, the application, wanted to differentiate Telnet-like behavior and transfer behavior by using a different diff serve code point. Well, but SSH did that or your client? SSH did that. Okay? And so this is a case of, well, we, weren't, we, did, have, we did trust the, the server port. We were going to accept whatever markings were coming out of that port because we didn't put QoS on there yet. And um, this is one of very few cases where the application did change the QoS value and that got us into trouble. Okay? Yeah, so that's one of the ways you do it is you strip it away, say I don't trust you, I'm going to I'm going to mark you based on my rules, right? If you're a via Cisco phone, I mark you EF, everything else default, if you're FTP, bulk bulk transfer, etc. Okay? So there are different ways uh, from a network standpoint that you can deal with to get over this problem. Um, did it break SSH on the other side? Yeah, so what is expecting the SSH to be that No. Um, surprisingly, well, we don't, actually, we don't know because the packets never got to the other side, right? But I don't think the, uh, the application cares too much about this serve because by the time it, the, the application comes up to the, the stack, it's all stripped out, right? The application doesn't know about dev serve code points. It's the stack that's doing it, right? Okay, so kind of a simple example. So any questions, anything else? Okay.